All right, well, good to be with you today. I wanna to welcome all of our locations and those of you that are part of our online family. We're glad to have you. If you have a Bible, go ahead and find Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12 is where we're gonna be and we are gonna end our time in Revelation. So buckle up, all right? So that's where we're starting, Genesis 12. Uh, when I was in college, I had somebody uh, hand me a book uh, by a British theologian and pastor by the name of John Stott. And the title of the book was called Between Two Worlds. And it was the first preaching book I'd ever read and it made a deep, deep impact on me. In fact, I reread it often. And he provides this kind of picture analogy of uh, what biblical preaching is. And he says, imagine that you've got a canyon and on one side of the canyon is the word of God. And on the other side of the canyon is the world in which we live. And he said, the job of a biblical sermon isn't just to stand on one side or the other of that canyon. So it's not just to stand on the word side and yell across at the world side. And it's not to come over to the world side and just kind of make some observation and give a you know, cool little TED talk. But the job of a biblical sermon is to start with the text and build a bridge into the context. It's to start with the word, build a bridge into the world. It's to start with the sacred and to build a bridge into the world of the secular and then walk back and forth across the canyon showing people the promises of God and the sovereignty of God in the world in which we live. So every time I stand up to preach, regardless of the passage, this question is on my mind. How are we to make sense of what is happening in the world in which we live by way of what has been recorded in the word? Uh, First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32 says that there were these uh, men of Issachar who understood the times in which they live. And because they understood the times, they were able to discern what their next steps should be. And our disposition should be the same today, that as we discern the times in which we live, uh, as we you know, watch the news, as we read commentary, as we look at social media, that we are not rocked by what we see. We're not knocked off balance emotionally by what we see because we are confident in what God's word says, what his promises are, and in his very nature. Now, that doesn't mean that we aren't grieved. It doesn't mean that we're not heartbroken. It doesn't mean that we're not, we don't drop to our knees in prayer, asking God to intervene and to change some things. It just means we're not knocked off balance emotionally because we're grounded firmly in what God's word says. And I think in this day and age of biblical illiteracy, we have a tendency to know more of what's going on on this side of the canyon than we do on this side of the canyon. And as a result, it's knocked us off balance emotionally, even those of us who call ourselves Christians. So in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, God hasn't given you a spirit of, tim of fear and timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-control. That's a verse that you might commit to memory, especially as we head into another contentious election this next year. And we might have a tendency to look at, we might watch the news and look at everything that's going on around the world and just be like, man, it feels like the rails have just come off. And we might be tempted in an emotional state to question God and say, God, why? God, where are you? Why are you allowing this? You ever done this? Man, if I was God, things would be totally different. Well, maybe, but I love the words of J. Vernon McGee. He said this one time, and only the way that he can say it, this is God's universe and God does things his way. You may have a better way, but you don't have a universe. You know, it's just kind of case closed. And so it's kind of with that sort of sober humility that we need to approach this. Well, uh, today I just want you to know that we were supposed to, this has been in months in the planning, we were supposed to kick off a new series of messages today called Out the Movies that we were gonna run through Christmas. And I just kind of felt like just with the world events, the conflict in Israel, things that were going on, all the questions that I've been getting from you, I've just like felt nudged by the spirit, it's actually more than a nudge, or the spirit of God is just like, you need to address uh, the word in the world. And we need to just, uh, because there's so much confusion and so, much, so many emotions and so much division. And so I just decided to, to punt that series by one week so that we could address this. Now, I want you to know, this is really not a message on uh, Israel necessarily per se or the conflict or what you see in the news or Hamas. Now we're gonna talk about those things, but this is primarily a message about Jesus. 
I wanna be very, very clear about that, that our view is on him and in him alone. In fact, let me just kind of tell you where we're going with this is that I'm gonna offer you a chance, an invitation to receive Jesus and be baptized today if you have never done so or if you're confused about where you stand with him or if you've drifted away from him in these times in which we live. Uh, first hour at the eight o'clock service, we, didn't have, we had zero baptisms planned. We had 10 spontaneous uh, from that. And so I'm just praying that there's gonna be uh, many more. And uh, that was just at this uh, location alone. So I'm not sure what happened at the other locations. Here's what prompted the sermon. And you all likely all uh, know this because you've seen it all over the news. Um, on Saturday, October the 7th, there's a known terrorist organization by the name of Hamas. And with, uh, that is a known terrorist organization within their charter. They have that their intent is to exterminate all Jews beginning in Israel and then around the world. And they went and they attacked innocent uh, men, women, and children. And they took the lives of over 1,400 uh, Jewish people. They took uh, hundreds of hostages. They sent videos of executions to family members. It was the largest single day killing of Jews since the Holocaust. Uh, many have described it as Israel's 9-11. Actually, though, if you take it in uh, a population comparison, it was magnified many times more. Now, since that time, as we've just kind of continued to see the media churn this thing, and as we've seen different perspectives and opinions and, and uh, protests that have happened, likely there's been a few conversations around the dinner table. And, uh, you know, this week's Thanksgiving, so there's probably a few more coming. And uh, there's probably, you know, all kinds of questions that you've been fielding and you've been asking and you're trying to figure this out. Like as Christians, and when I say that, I'm not talking about like Christians in name only. I'm talking about filled with the spirit of God. Jesus is Lord, like our allegiance is to him that uh, awakened by his spirit. There is a difference. And so it's like, well, so as a Christ follower, what, how should we think about this conflict? What should our response be? What should our disposition be? Uh, here's some questions. Where did this conflict come from? How far back does it go? What is it about? Um, how should we see this? What about the innocent civilians that are being wounded and killed both in Israel and in Palestine? By the way, there are Christians in Palestine. How are we to think about all of that? Now, what I want you to, uh, we gotta start here with just two things. The first thing that I want you to know is that um, this is what happened October 7th and, and what is ongoing right now is a continuation of a 4,000 year old problem. Just let that rest on you for a minute. How old are your problems? Some of you are like 18. No, no I'm not talking about that. <laughs> that just came to me. That wasn't even in my notes. All right, so. Um, <laughs> So uh, my problems are mostly like, you know, a couple weeks, a couple months. I might have a problem or two that's going on into a year, but most of my problems aren't 4,000 years old. So that fact in, a, in and of itself um, should remind us, I love what theologian N.T. Wright says about this as he was talk, talking about this conflict and he lived over there for a while. He said, we need to understand this is a 4,000 year old conflict. It's, it's, it, it's on the other side of the world. It is multi-layered, it is complex. Therefore, there, there have been generations trying to fix this problem and can't. Therefore, we should approach it with a great amount of intellectual and emotional humility. And I actually don't see much of that in the news. Usually it's people kind of throwing like knowledge grenades across the other side, like, well, if we just do this, this would fix it. And we just gotta realize this is a very multifaceted problem. Here's the second thing we've gotta remember is that what is happening in physical realms and physical nations is spilling out of the spiritual realms. So Ephesians 6 talks about the principalities and powers of darkness in the evil realm. So I'm gonna talk about this here in just a minute, but the real enemy is not people of other political persuasions, lifestyles, or religions. It's not Muslim people. It's, it's, it's not, not necessarily even specifically Hamas. It's the spirit behind it the principalities and powers of darkness in the evil realm. So I wanna start in Genesis 12. I do wanna uh, just kind of give some uh, recognition here. Uh, man, pastors Chris Hodges, Greg Laurie, uh, Josh Howerton, all of those individuals have just really helped me take a large amount of Old Testament history and summarize it to where I could scream through this in about 30 minutes. So I wanna uh, uh, give recognition to them. But I wanna start in Genesis chapter 12. And this, it, it all starts, October 7th, it all goes back to the calling of a man by the name of Abram. Now the book of Joshua tells us that he was called out of a pagan family. And look at what it says in Genesis 12, 1. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. Now, 4,000 years later, we know that that land that God was referring to is the land of Israel, the promised land. 
And Abram believed God's promise and it says that it was credited to him as righteousness. That's what happens when you believe God's promise. He credits righteousness into your account. And so Abram leaves his family and his nation. He travels to this land that God had called him. This, then we pick it up in Genesis 15. God, seeing Abram's faith, changes his name to Abraham. And if any of you grew up in church, maybe you remember singing the song, Father Abraham, this is the guy. And he establishes a covenant with him. Now there is a difference between a contract and a covenant. So a contract is very, very common in written cultures where people can read and write. But they lived in a very verbal visual culture. So a contract says this, and this is likely what you have with your bank, with your mortgage. I will be what I should be for you if you are what you should be to me. In other words, you make your payments on time, we'll let you keep your house. You're upholding your end of the contract. But they lived in a very visual verbal culture. So they had a covenant and a covenant said this, and this is what God made with Abraham. I will be what I should be to you, even if you are not what you should be to me. Now here's how, it would, here's how they would um, uh, kind of seal this covenant is um, the greater party and the lesser party would show up. They would take a slaughtered lamb, cut up the pieces, lay it in a line. The lesser party would walk the pieces of the lamb, reciting the terms of the covenant. I will be what I should be uh, to you. And if not, then may I become like the pieces of this slain lamb. Aren't you thankful you don't have that with your bank? All right, so now Genesis 15, when God establishes this covenant with Abraham, he does something unprecedented. At the exact time that Abraham was getting ready to walk the pieces of this slain lamb, God puts him into a deep sleep. And then it says that he shows up as a flaming fire pot. That's the exact term that is used to describe God on Mount Sinai when he gives Moses the 10 commandments. And while Abraham is snoring away, God himself walks the pieces of the slain lamb, reciting the terms of the covenant. And he was saying to Abraham, as well as to all of his offspring, and to those of us today who have responded by faith, we've been grafted into the family tree, that if you break the covenant, I will become like the pieces of this slain lamb, foreshadowing the lamb of God who would give his life for us on a cross. And because God walked the pieces of this lamb, that is what is called an unbreakable covenant, or Bible scholars call this an unconditional covenant, where God both makes and meets the demands and the terms of the covenant. So as he does this, there are three parts to this promise. One is the land. So he promises Abraham uh, the promised land. That's referring to Israel. Two is the lineage. And he goes, hey, Abraham, I know that you and Sarah don't have any kids right now, but you're gonna have a son by faith. And actually out of that son is gonna come a descendant who will become the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the lineage. And then the third is Lord. A descendant will become the, the Messiah. Um, and so when God gave this promise, what happened was a spiritual war got waged and has been raging ever since. Now I've talked to you about this way back in our series on Romans and periodically I feel like I need to remind you of it, that God is a Holy Spirit and we have an enemy who is an unholy spirit. Every time there is an action of the Holy Spirit, there is an opposite reaction of unholy spirits. Satan is not an innovator. Satan doesn't create, he recreates. He is a deceiver. So what he does is he takes the good things that God has created for, our, for his glory and our joy, and he um, distorts them for the purpose of deception. So here's what that looks like. Whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits. Whatever God builds, Satan breaks. Whatever God does, Satan seeks to undo and oppose. God sparks awakenings within us. Satan lulls us to sleep. I've given this visual before. I'll give it to you again because it's the only bit of humor that I've got in this message. And that is uh, God uh, gives us the original. Satan gives us the copy. So if God gave us Fruit Loops, Satan gave us Fruit Spins. God gave us Pringles. Satan gives us Prongles. God gives us Dr. Pepper and Mountain Dew. Satan gives us Dr. Bob and Mountain Shouting. All right? That's an easier way to remember it. And every time you go to the grocery store, now you'll remember. And it's probably the part of the sermon that you'll remember. All right? So... So that's the, that's the point. Whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits. And that should stop all of us in our tracks whenever we're beginning to question God. 
is that there is a deceiver behind the scenes trying to counterfeit and trying to deceive us. And Ephesians 6 says that our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people who have different political views than you. It's not against people who have other lifestyles or other religions or other nations. It's the principalities and powers of darkness behind the scenes. And so we just came through a series where I said, we need to be awakened to the voice, power, and presence of God. We need to be equally awakened to what Satan is doing. The Bible says that it is schemes. And through the rest of the Bible and into today, Satan is seeking to oppose God in a spiritual war being waged over three questions. Well, who gets the land and whose lineage prevails and who will be Lord? That brings us to Genesis 16. So Abraham is married to Sarah. God promises them in old age that they will have a son. Out of that son, one of his descendants will be the true Lord, the, the Messiah. But they are getting up there in years. They haven't had any kids. They've got fertility issues. And Sarah gets impatient with the promises of God. And she decides to take matters into her own hands and create a shortcut. Any of you ever do that? You just get impatient with God. Like, I feel like God told me that he's gonna come through, but he hasn't yet. And so we kind of take the wheel and we kind of control the scenario. That's what Sarah does. So she, uh, unable to get pregnant, takes her servant, Hagar, who is a pagan Egyptian woman, by the way. And she says to Abraham, why don't you sleep with her? Maybe she'll get pregnant. And through her, we can have a son. And I would just say, fellas, if you have not been in the habit of listening to your wives, don't let this be the first time you do, all right? That usually doesn't end very well. And what happens is Abraham sleeps with Hagar and she has a son and they name that son Ishmael. Now listen to what it says in chapter 16, verse 12 about Ishmael. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand will be against him and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. So this is a prophecy. And this prophecy about Ishmael is that he would be in constant conflict with his brother, specifically the stepbrother that he would have in Isaac when Abraham and Sarah would give birth to him. This prophecy is 4,000 years old, and it means that the descendants would constantly be at war, and they still are today. So Ishmael grows up and has 12 sons. While that's going on, God fulfills his promise to Abraham and Sarah, in their old age, they get pregnant. That is a complete miracle. They are 90 and 100 years old at the time. And they have a son and they name him Isaac. Isaac grows up, he has 12 sons, which eventually come, become the 12 tribes of Israel. Ishmael grows up, he has 12 sons. Whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits. So here's what you have. You have Abraham, two wives, two sons, two sets of 12 grandchildren, one covenant all fighting over these questions. Who gets the land? Whose lineage will be blessed? And from which son will come the one true Lord? Now, because Isaac was born out of faith towards uh, Abraham and Sarah, God chooses Isaac over Ishmael. And so Isaac uh, uh, gets, receives that blessing. Now skip ahead to Genesis 22. God tells Abraham to do the unthinkable. And many of you know the story. Uh, they finally have this, you know, miracle child. And God says to him in verse two, take your son, your only son, which that is um, a foreshadowing of Jesus, that term right there. Because Jesus is God's only son. And he says, uh, the son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Now, here's what we need to stop and consider is that they already lived in a place surrounded by mountains. So why would God lead them three days journey away to the Mount of Moriah? You ever wonder that? Well, the location that it is believed to be that God led Abraham and Isaac is up on this mountain is currently where the Dome of the Rock resides today in Jerusalem. Maybe you've seen it, you've seen pictures, maybe you've been there. I was just there a few months ago. That is the former location of the Holy of Holies, this sort of epic battle between Muslims and Christians over this sacred space. Now, here's part of the reason why. Muslims claim that it wasn't Isaac that was offered on that mountain as a sacrifice, it was Ishmael. And the scriptures tell us it was Isaac and God stops that from happening, provides a substitute sacrifice who would die in the place of Isaac. Now, 2000 years later, Isaac would have a descendant named Jesus who goes to the same 
mountain, Golgotha, the same place to die as a sacrifice for you and me. Isaiah chapter 53, verse five says, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Jesus fulfills that promise and becomes a sacrifice in our place. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Now, tw- that was a very weak golf clap for that. So, so 20, I didn't give you enough time. I know it's on me. All right, so 24 Hundred years later, 2,400 years from when I, Abraham takes Isaac to that place, a guy by the name of Muhammad is born. By the way, a descendant of Ishmael. And Muhammad goes into a cave. He says that there was an angel. He calls it an angel that appears to him, gives him a gospel contrary to the one handed down by the apostles. And he establishes a new religion. Whatever God creates, Satan counterfeits. And so here's what Islam contends is that the Hebrew scriptures are wrong, that God chose Hagar, not Sarah. God chose Ishmael, not Isaac. And that Ishmael was the one that went up on the mountain. And here's the result. From their perspective, they say all the promises of the Abrahamic covenant belong not to Isaac, the Jewish people, but to the descendants of Ishmael, modern day Arabs. And Muhammad was a descendant of Ishmael. Uh, Paul actually kind of foreshadows this in Galatians 1, 7 and 8. He says, evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or notice this, an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. So Islam says, and this is why there is conflict even today. No, that is our land, that is our lineage, that is our Lord, Allah, not Jesus. And the result has been 2,000 years of constant war between the descendants of Isaac and Ishmael. So here's what happened on October the 7th. Uh, Hamas, descendants of Ishmael, attacked the lineage of Isaac in a fight over the land, shouting Allah Akbar as they shot people, our God is greater, opposing the Lord. And behind nations and kings, there are principalities and powers at work. Let me read Ephesians 6 to you. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's what? Schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, other people, not not even like people of other religions, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. With this in mind, be alert. Another word for that is awakened. And always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now, I want to lay out just two real quick principles that come out of that passage. Here's what I think it means to be strong in the Lord. All right. Number one, jot this down if you're taking notes or take a picture of it. Being strong in the Lord means we will not allow ever-changing headlines to make us emotionally unstable. The headlines are always changing, sparking either fear or anger, and you are usually not at your best when you are in fear or anger, and it actually shows that you're not trusting in the sovereignty and promises of God. It means that when we see the ever-changing headlines, we are very sober-minded, and we're not going to draw dramatic conclusions from what we see in the news, social media, or TikTok. Winston Churchill once said it this way. He goes, the story gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to put on its pants. And that was pre-internet. Here's the second principle. Being strong in the Lord means we simultaneously, we can hold two things in tensions, guys, to pray for the conflict to end while also praying for God's justice to be done and evil to be stopped. And I know right now people are screaming, you gotta pick a side. And we can hold a couple of things in tension here. We can be grieved over the loss of life in Israel and in Palestine. And standing with Israel biblically doesn't necessarily mean we're taking a stand on foreign policy decisions. We're recognizing the God that has given his promise. And the real issue behind all of this is both the group and the word Hamas. What I mean by that is, yes, Hamas is a known terrorist organization, but when you look at the meaning of the word, it is the Arabic word for zeal, the Hebrew word for violent evil, and it's found in the Bible. It's used some 60 times in the Bible, identifying physical violence. It's sometimes translated as possessed. We actually see it in Genesis 6.11. Genesis 6.11 says this, Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. And the original word in the original language there is Hamas. So if you read it this way, it says, now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with Hamas. 
It's used again in Genesis 16 to describe the conflict between Sarah and Hagar because the same spirit is alive behind the scenes today. And in every generation, there is a world power that rises up to try to exterminate the Jewish people, starting with Egypt, then the Philistines, then Babylon, Persia, Rome, the Nazis, and now Hamas. Why do the same things keep happening? Because the same spirit behind the heavenly realms is still at work to take the land, to eradicate the lineage, and to redefine the Lord. So here's the question. What does all this mean? And that's maybe likely what you've been asking. Like when October 7th happened, there was a lot of people that were like, man, is this Bible prophecy? Are we in the last days? Like um, the, the Bible does say that there is, like Israel's been at war for centuries. The Bible does say that there is a war to end all wars. Uh, is this it? Well, we don't know. I mean, it could be, maybe not. Like Israel's been at war for a long, long time. Uh, uh, really the main point is that we are not um, alarmed. We are alert and awakened. And that actually the attacks of October 7th, if anything, should draw our eyes upward towards Jesus. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, it actually describes the war to end all wars. And it talks about how there, there are these nations that are surrounding Israel and the names have changed. Um, but in, in the passage, it talks about a place called Gog and Magog. And we know that as modern day Russia. It talks about Persia, that corresponds to modern day Iraq, Iran. It talks about Gomer and Beth uh, to Togermai, that refers to modern day Turkey. And then it mentions some nations in the South, like Libya, Ethiopia, Sudan. And the Bible says that there will be an invasion, the war to end all wars will be an invasion from the North and the South around Israel for three things, the land, the lineage, and oppose the Lord. Revelation 16 calls this the battle of Armageddon. Maybe you've heard about that. And it has nothing to do with Arnold Schwarzenegger or Terminator. See, what happens is the battle of Armageddon is when all the world powers attack Israel from the north and the south. Um, and that, that could be the war to end all wars. And that's a little scary because it kind of looks like, man, that, that maybe could happen. But, the, but there's a lot of hope in Ezekiel 38 and 39. What it says is that um, if nobody intervened, and Israel was attacked from the north and the south, uh, resulting in the loss of the land, the eradication of the lineage and the opposition of the Lord. It says that's the moment where hope will be restored because there will be a warrior emerge from the heavens, sitting on a war horse with a sword coming out of his mouth and a sweet tattoo on his thigh that says, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that's when Jesus shows up to win the war. Now look at what it says in Zechariah chapter 14. The day of the Lord is coming, Jerusalem, when your possessions will be plundered and divided up within your very walls. I will gather the nations of Jerusalem to fight against it. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. I actually got a chance to visit that just a few months ago when I was in Israel, east of Jerusalem. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west. So the Mount of Olives is where Jesus ascended into heaven when he resurrected. It says this is where he will descend upon his return. And Revelation says that he will come in glory. The two most important um, events in human history are the first and second coming of Jesus. And they're very, very different. The first coming of Jesus, he came in humility. The next time he comes will be in glory. The first time he came was on the colt of a donkey. The next time he comes will be on a war horse. The first time he came was to save sinners. The next time he comes will be to judge sin. The first time he came is to die for the world. The next time he comes is to win the war. And when he returns, he eradicates evil. He undoes death and injustice, and he wipes away every tear that we have shed in this world. In fact, Revelation tells us that he's keeping track of every tear you shed because of the pain and brokenness in this world, and he's gonna reconcile all of those tears. So he is going to undo all the evil that we see taking place every day in the news. Now, here's, here's the, the focus of today. Man, if you are still breathing, like if you have a pulse, if you're hearing this message, then God is trying to get your attention. Because right now, the invitation that God gave to Abram 
And the invitation that he's given to countless men and women through the centuries is the invitation that he's giving to you right now. And the door of salvation is wide open. That if you would trust God and believe in the promises of God, it will be credited to you as righteousness. When you recognize your sin, you recognize that Jesus is the son of God, that he paid the price that you could never pay. That door to being reconciled with God is wide open. But the Bible tells us that one day it will close shut. And when will that happen? When will Jesus return? We don't really know. Then the point isn't to know. In fact, Jesus himself said, I don't know. I'm the one that's returning. I don't even know the day or the hour. Because the point is, is that you just need to always be ready. It's kind of like if your parents, you know, like if you're a teenager, your parents leave and, and, uh, you know, uh, you don't know when they're going to return. Uh, you're just kind of like, you know, well, you know, uh, I guess we got to always be ready. But if they tell you, no, we're going to be back Saturday night at 8 p.m., you make sure that the party's done and the house is cleaned up by 8 p.m. But if it's kind of open-ended, like, hey, we don't know when they're going to come back, that you're just always ready. That's the point. Jesus says, man, just always be ready. And we can't know the exact day and hour, but we can know the season. And actually the scriptures equate it to a woman who's about to give birth. And if you're uh, scheduled to give birth naturally, not a C-section, you don't know the exact day and hour you're going to deliver that baby, but by looking at the pregnant woman, you can tell if she's getting close. You can tell by the pains and the contractions if she's about to give birth. And the same thing is true as we look at the world. That's what October 7th did, is it should be a, that is a birth pain. And uh, there are a couple of things that we know in the scriptures prophecies about the return of Jesus that could not have been true until the last 50 to 75 years or so. I'll just give you a couple. Revelation tells us that there will come a day right before Jesus returns when there will be an event that will happen on the other side of the world and everybody will instantly see it. And for years, everybody's like, how can that happen? Well, Steve Jobs gave us a little thing called a smartphone. And now when something happens on the other side of the world, all of us instantly see it. Here's another thing in the book of Daniel. It says that right before Jesus returns, there will be an increase in travel, which in the first century took you forever to get somewhere. Now you can get on the other side of the world just on a flight. And there will be an increase in knowledge. There is a, guys, we live in what is called the information age. And so we just Google it or chat GPT it. And all of a sudden we've got all the information that we need. Both of those things have happened just in the last 50 to 60 years or sooner. Jesus answered the question as to his return in Matthew 24. They said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And Jesus answered, watch out, be alert, be awakened, that no one deceives you. Lots of deception out there. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Man, every time you turn on the news. But see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith, deconstruction, and will betray and hate each other, racism, division, Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Be strong in the Lord. Put on the full armor of God. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Guys, if this unsettles you in any way, if this concerns you, if this causes fear, God doesn't want you to be alarmed. God wants you to be alert. He wants you to be awakened. He wants you to come to a knowledge of the truth. Some of us are looking around. Have you ever heard somebody say this? Or maybe you felt this way. Man, you just like turn on the news. You're just like, your soul is so weary. You're just looking at everything going, man, you know, God, how much longer? How much more can we take? Why are you waiting? When will you come back? That's a good question. And 2 Peter chapter 3 gives us a pretty good answer. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is, now I need you to look at me right now, because this word may not be for everybody, but it's for somebody. Somebody in one of our locations, somebody watching online, God is patient with you. 
And as soon as I say that, you know who I'm talking to. You know I'm talking to you. That the Spirit of God is convicting you because He's being patient with you right now. You've been wrestling with Him for week, weeks and months and maybe even years. And right now, He is patient with you because He wants you to come to a saving knowledge of the truth and to have a relationship with Him. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone regardless of political preference, regardless of religion, regardless of lifestyle. He wants everyone to come to repentance and a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why he's waiting. Why is God waiting when it seems like the world, the wheels are coming off? He's waiting for you. And I can't help but think that on October the 7th, like, you know, it says that Jesus is at the right hand of God mediating on our behalf. That's where he is right now. October the 7th happened. I don't know what news channel Jesus watches. <laughs> None, I think. And so he sees what happens on October the 7th and he kind of turns to God like, you know, hey, like, wow. Like, is this it? And God's like, this might be it. You know, and he's getting the war horse out. He's polishing up the tattoo. He's getting the sword out. And then God's like, wait a second. Just one more, just one more. Let's, let's wait. There's one more that needs to receive Jesus. There's one more that needs to be saved. And it could be that the reason why God is waiting is you. The reason why he's waiting is your lost neighbor or your wayward child or that person that you're gonna have a Thanksgiving meal with this Thursday and they're gonna wanna pick a fight with you about politics and maybe it's them and actually by your sober response, your spirit-filled response, it'll bring them or remind them to a saving truth of Jesus Christ. Maybe right now there's somebody, you're, you're pegged to your seat right now because you're like, I don't really know where I stand with God and I didn't know any of that Old Testament history stuff. What do I do with this? Here's what you do with it. You recognize that there is a God, that you are not him, that this world has fallen, that you're a sinner, you need to believe God so that it can be credited to you as righteousness. You receive Jesus by that. The Holy Spirit enters into you and you obey by being dunked into water, which represents your spiritual death and you are resurrected as a new creation in Christ. And today we wanna give you the opportunity to do that at all of our locations. And so right now uh, I'm gonna pray that I'm gonna kick it over to our campus pastors to provide some instructions for their specific locations. And I'll give you some instructions here at Northwest. But uh, let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that you are sovereign and in control. Forgive us when we become fearful or angry over the headlines and the chaos that we see in this world. And may we bring our eyes back and fix them upon you. Thank you for the promise that you've given us. Thank you for giving us a covenant and not a contract because we could never fulfill our end of the deal but you make and meet the terms of that covenant. And so God, today, I just pray that even if there's just one person that recognizes that they need to step forward and give their lives to you, I pray that they would step out of darkness into light, that they would uh, cease the, the voice of deception and they would choose to believe the truth and they would stand up to their feet and in obedience, they would walk out into that hallway and that they would receive you and be baptized today. So that way it could be settled in their mind where they will spend eternity when you return. And so, Father, we celebrate that today. May you get the glory. May lives be changed forever and ever. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.